church at, at one point was like, um, okay, everyone greet your neighbor. And um, it was like the same thing every week. We're like, hi, how you doing? Good, awesome, okay. And that's it. Um, so the point of these questions is to hopefully get us into a little bit deeper conversation. It's kind of like a mini small group every Sunday morning. And so you have a few minutes to discuss something with someone else and uh, hopefully learn something about them and uh, maybe have something to pray with them about. So today's question is a pointed question. Um, let me find it here. There's 21 of these, so I'll, I'll keep... Um, those of you that don't remember, this is John Wesley's uh, 21 questions that he used basically to form kind of the foundation of discipleship in the Methodist church. And the Methodist church at one point was the fastest growing church in the world. It was essentially the Pentecostal church of 150 years ago. And um, so these are, uh, these are like proven over a century and a half's worth of, uh, of testing. So, and these all still apply today, which is um, really interesting to me. So today's question is question number 10. Do I pray about the money that I spend? Do I pray about the money that I spend? So it's very easy for us, especially during the holiday season, to just kind of buy. And we could go crazy, right? Um, we can like get crazy with the gifts, and before we know it, we're over our head in credit card debt or whatever else might be. So today's question that you're to talk to your neighbor about or whoever, you can go across the room, go wherever you want to. Do you pray about the money that you spend?
We're not powerless. Say, I'm not powerless. God has empowered you to be able to um, go through these situations with His grace. Now, as usual, preachers always have a selfish motive, right, when they talk about something. So, uh, I, I gave you that question very pointedly for a reason today. This is like a little hot for me. Is it too hot for you? Okay. It'll be worse if I take my hat off. It'll be worse. Is this bothering anybody? <laughs> Does this bother anyone? All right. We have three opportunities for special giving this coming season, and so I want you to make sure um, that you are prayerfully considering ways that we can help our fellow human beings uh, in our city and around the world. So the first, first special giving opportunity that we have is called the Go Offering. We do the Go Offering every year at Living Water Church. It's part of our denominational giving, and it's for the Global Outreach Offering. That's what Go stands for. And so the Global Outreach Offering is everyone is encouraged to give one day's wage. So if you consider how much money you make in a year, you divide that number by about 250, and you'll get approximately what one day's worth of your income is. And so if everyone would give a single day's wage, we would fund the entire global missions movement in one offering. And that's just if the people in the United States gave one day's wage, it would fund missions work in over 100 countries for the whole year. Pretty cool, right? And so just consider, prayerfully consider um, giving to the Go offering. We give as a, as a board, we do set aside part of our missions giving every year towards the Go offering. So we're not at zero, but we're trying to raise about $3,000 total, and I think we have approximately $2,000 set aside. So we're trying to raise over the next uh, three, four weeks. Yeah, it's good. So over the next three, four weeks, we're trying to like meet and exceed that goal, hopefully. So consider that. Uh, the second one is uh, Christmas for, help Christmas for kids in our community. So um, we have for the past, I think, six years, um, we've been doing a ministry partnering with Armstrong County Jail. And so there's a lot of uh, par- kids that have parents that are in prison. And so if your parents are in prison, um, you don't really get the same Christmas that other kids would get. And so what we do is we try to purchase gifts for those kids uh, that, have, uh, that have parents that are in jail. And then we uh, normally, we have the opportunity then to go and be with the family. Um, some of you can attest to how fun that is. And so we can go and be with these kids and be with their caregivers, and we can give gifts to them, and normally we get to read them the Christmas story. And it's just a really, it's a really fun thing. It normally costs between $50 and $75 per kid to do that. Uh, this year, we have uh, over 10 kids already. Uh, there's a couple just from the jail ministry, and then we, get, we do get requests through the holiday season too, just for different families asking for help. Um, giving different situations, and so we try to filter through those, and however much money we have, that's how much we can help, and so um, if we could raise between five and seven hundred fifty dollars for that, uh, we would be able to uh, probably fund the entire um, Christmas giving for the kids that are asking for help, and for the ones that are being assigned to us from the jail ministry. So that's the second one. The third one is Hope Center. Um, I would just really... uh, if you can prayerfully consider, we have about $86,000 that we've raised so far out of $129,500. Um, those of you that aren't familiar with that, we are raising money to start a Hope Center in Armstrong County. That will be purchasing a residential house here that will house between 20 and 30 individuals that are caught in the struggle of addiction to alcohol or drugs. So they would be able to then live in that house. Um, the, at the end of their um, time there, between 9 and 12 months is the program. Uh, the first 45 days, they just get a complete overhaul, basically. It's just intensive counseling and kind of that detox phase and the, what we would call in Christianity, renewing the mind. And then over the course of the next nine months, they actually get connected um, through a temp agency that is within the house. They get connected to local employment. So they get to kind of practice that reintegration into normal societal life and at the same time still have that stable um, home life in, uh, in the Hope Center. And so, um, so we're trying to raise money to have one of those here. Their success rates right now um, are between 60 and 70 percent, and they have been for the past 17 years. So if you kind of do the math in your mind, if we have 30 individuals go through the program every year, and if two-thirds of them uh, find complete healing in Jesus Christ, that's going to be 20 people, 20 individuals, whose lives have been completely turned around every year. Yeah. 
And if you know anything about addiction, if you've ever been touched by addiction, you know that when one person gets healed of addiction, it's not healing for just one person. It's healing for their children. It's healing for spouses. It's healing for parents and grandparents. We're praying that this would be healing not just for an individual, but it would be healing for generations. And so the faster that we can raise this money, the faster that we can move forward with this project, and the faster that we can begin to see that transformation of our community and individuals, which is our mission, accelerated in Armstrong County. Good stuff, right? So why I wanted you to talk to each other about do you prayerfully consider how you spend your money is because you may not need that extra $100 of stuff for Christmas dinner. You can help a kid, two kids, experience a whole different Christmas this year. Or maybe you don't need to spend $1,000 on gifts for the family, but God is calling you to put $1,000 towards the Hope Center project. I don't know. That's between you and the Lord. Um, but I just want to make those things available to you and have us be prayerfully watching. But when God blesses, he blesses us to be a blessing. Right? And so let's, um, let's take that to heart. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to be here with friends and with family this morning. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters and for myself, God, that you would continue to shape and to mold us into what you want us to be. Lord, our deep desire is that we would be more like your son, Jesus Christ. May we know that every waking moment of his day, he was in perfect communion with you walking and talking with you, walking in rest, walking in peace, walking in the joy that can only come from you. God, help us to have that in our own lives as we move through this season. The season of worldly celebration, yes, but a season of remembering that you gave your only son, that you condescended to come down from heaven in bodily form as a baby, to live the perfect life, and to die the perfect death on our behalf. We thank you most of all this morning for Jesus, for the hope that he brings to us, and for the hope that he brings to this city. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm. Stand with us. We'll uh, go ahead and get started in worship. You know what, I do want to just stop and pray real quick for several people. Um, the, Kim and Tyler were supposed to be here this morning leading worship, but they uh, they diagnosed with COVID last night. So um, they both have that they're dealing with right now. So if we can be in special prayer for them. Um, and then for um, Aaron has been dealing with a lot of different things with his lungs and with uh, um, just different different ailments that that has kind of brought about through different medication changes that they're trying to kind of get everything balanced out. So if we can just be praying for them and, um, and for Jackie, just for continued healing for her. Uh, so let's just pray. Lord, we pray for uh, Kim and Tyler. We pray for Aaron and for Jackie for continued healing in their bodies. Uh, Lord, when, the, when pieces of the body are missing, Lord, we are, are desperately missing them. And um, we pray that wholeness would come into their lives. The wholeness that was purchased through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, you said that by your stripes we are healed. And so we proclaim that healing in their lives over lungs, over bodies, that everything would be cleared out, and that they would be completely free uh, to move about and to do all of the things that you have called them to do. They are all precious in your sight, and they are dear brothers and sisters to us draw them close to you in this time. May they be comforted and healed. In Jesus' name. Amen. sing this first song almost as a prayer this morning. You could just proclaim it over this area. 
over this body, over our families. You're the God of the city. You're the king of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in the darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. And there is no one like our God. There is no one like you, God. But greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done here. You believe that? Do we believe that our best days are ahead? Yes. You're the Lord. You're the Lord of creation, the creator of all kings. You're the king above all kings. You are. You're the strength in the weakness. You're the love to the broken. You're the joy in the sadness. You are. Because there is no one like our God. There is no one like you, God. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. Where glory shines from heart to life, the praise. no one like our God. There is no one like you, God. Lord, we just worship you this morning. We give you all the glory for all the things that have been done and all the things that will be done. Our Father who in heaven reigns, how great and mighty is your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done. Now here on earth as is above. Oh, give to us our daily bread. And keep our hungry spirits fed. May all our satisfaction be in you whose grace has set us free. Give us hope, give us faith, help us trust in your guidance from the depths of your grace you have richly provided. Thank you, thank you, Father, you are all we need. Father, you are all we need. Just express that to him in your own way this morning. Just thank him for being everything you need. Oh, 
we trust you, Lord. Oh, we love you, Lord. I need you. Soften my heart, break me apart. I need you to open my eyes, see that you're shaping my life. Sing that again. I need you. Soften my heart to break me apart. I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life. And all I am, I serve. Trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my life. I need you to soften my heart, to break me apart. I need you to pierce through the dark and cleanse every part of me. Sing that again. I need you. in my heart to break every part of me I need you to pierce through the dark and cleanse every part of me it's all
There's freedom though you capture me. I've got joy instead of mourning. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom though you captured me. I've got joy instead of warning. You give me joy down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul.
soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. You give me joy, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. We can give him praise. That's fine. Thank you, Lord, for your joy. For your joy unspeakable, Lord. For your joy unspeakable. We love you so much. Speak to us through your word this morning, we pray. Help you to change us, transform us, and mold us into who you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. So good. I love that. Never been so free, caught in your love for me. Never been more secure, knowing your heart, Lord. It's kind of a weird, um, like we don't, we don't term it that way a lot, 
a lot of songs talk about the grace and the love of God, and, the, and that is very true. But the, the true freedom is found in, like, actually knowing his heart for us. It's like when we can come to him and when we can truly know how he wants us to live and now we have the freedom to operate in that, it changes everything. Like, just to, to know and to have purpose, and that only comes from him. There's so many people in the world that, even, that people that come to church and that um, are living their life wholly in their own way and come to church just to kind of feel better once a week or to get fueled up, so to speak, and then hopefully they can last another seven days until next Sunday at 10. That's not how we're supposed to live our lives. This is supposed to, the Sunday morning really should be a celebration of what God did in the other six days. Now, I understand there are times and there are seasons where we are just literally holding on for dear life. And he's in that too. But we can walk in a peace, we can walk in a just total security when we're walking and being obedient to what he has for us. Amen? Man, love it. Um, where we left off last week, we're just going to continue right in this vein. I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to read right through. This is uh, 10 through 13. I just thought you'd, does it help if we get a little refresher? Yeah, so we get some context where we're at. It helps me at least, I don't know. Sing to the Lord a new song. I know it says Adonai there, but I'm trying to teach you some Jewish words. That's why we're using the tree of life version here. Adonai is the word for Lord. So I might just read it and you'd be like, Andy, can you not even read? I'm trying to help you, okay? All right. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea with all its fullness, islands and their inhabitants, let the desert and its cities exult, the villages that Kedar inhabits. Let the dwellers of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout for joy from the top of the mountains. And so we left off with like this great celebration coming out of like, get rid of your worthless idols and you now stand on the rock and stand on the grace of God. And you can sing a new song in that. God's doing a new thing we're going to be learning in the next chapter that we go through. And we said, let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the islands. The Lord goes out as a mighty one. He stirs up his zeal like a man of war. He will shout, yes, raise a war cry. He will prevail over his enemies. And we talked last week about how this is not, this is not about like a uh, conquering victory as an army. God is calling us into a spiritual battle. And truly, there is a spiritual war going on right now at this very minute that you are called to be a soldier in. And it's God's war cry that is supposed to be our war cry into the world. Amen? You with me so far? So we come out of that, and we come into this verse, which is very weird. Yes. 42, sorry, Isaiah 42. Thank you, Vicky. I'm derelict in my duties. Open your Bibles this morning to Isaiah chapter 42. We're going to finish the chapter today, and we, we're going to finish the chapter today. Uh, yes. And that's all I'm going to say. Say amen if you're there. All right. So we come to this verse that's kind of very odd. It says, I have held my peace a long time. I have been still and restrained myself. Now like a woman in labor, I groan, gasping and panting at once. Who's that talking about? Anybody? Say it louder. God. Yeah, it's talking about God. It's kind of a weird statement about God, though, isn't it? Like, I don't really picture God as a woman in labor. Anyone else think that's a little weird? Yeah, I think it's kind of weird. And so um, we're going to talk about that a little bit, because I, I do think there's, there's some context here that we need to pick up. Um, so it's quite a difficult verse to begin with today. Other translations might look a little bit different. Um, the King James, if you have a King James this morning, it says, I have long time holding my peace. Man, that's why I don't read the King James right there. I have been still and refrained to myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. Quite different. Quite different. And so you can see the translators have a lot of trouble here. 
But the word does point to this woman in labor, and if, if we look at that actual word, woman in labor, um, it is, uh, sorry, um, it means to, like, to bear and to bring forth, to bear and to bring forth. And so kind of the whole point of this verse is God basically speaking to Israel. He's saying, I've been, I've been quiet for a long, long time. Um, holding his peace here, actually, it doesn't seem to be that he's withholding a good thing from them. The word peace there is not the word, um, it's not the word shalom, which is like the Old Testament word for peace. And so it's not that God is withholding his completeness or his fullness or his, or his, his total joy for them. That's not it. It's like when you're holding your peace, it means kind of like you're holding your tongue. Like have you ever been in a situation and like words were about to come out of your mouth and you're like, you've got to hold your peace. Yeah? Because I'm about to like make some serious war here. <laughs> Am I the only one that that happens to every now and again? And then Holy Spirit's like, stop! Stop! It's not time yet. Well, God's saying that. He's saying, I've been holding back quite a while here. But um, I'm about to, to bear something. I'm about to bring something forth, and um, it's not going to be pretty. And I have a lot of, you know, like, labor's not, it's not pretty. Um, from the woman's perspective, I can't really speak to that, but from the man's perspective, I can say it's definitely not pretty. Uh, they get to feel all the things, and I, I would gladly take my job versus that job, okay? But um, to see all the things is quite an experience as well onto its own, um, not in any way on par, I'm not saying that at all, but um, to see kind of the ugliness of that, we can get an idea of the ugliness of what God is talking about here. He's like, I'm going to bring something forth, but it's also interesting that, um, that God, we're in a season where we celebrate God coming to earth and being brought forth in that way, and that's very difficult for my mind to wrap around still, like how does God come down in bodily form? He grows inside Mary as a baby, and he's birthed in that whole process, the blood and the gore and the screaming and the crying and the everything in what amounts to like a, a, a barn or a stable. Like God, the God of all creation, the God that we just talked about at the end of last week that we are worshiping and glorifying, and he brings this thing forth in this kind of ugliness of humanity. The word there, gasping and panting, the words have different meanings like to, to crush and to destroy as well. And so I can see where both translators get it from, but the point of the verse is, God says, I've been holding back for a long time, and that time's coming to an end. You with me? Hmm. And it, I'm just kind of thinking about this in the moment here. After the time of exile and the, the Israelites' return, there was a period of 400 years where uh, there were no prophecies given, where God was literally silent in the nation of Israel. And when that silence was broken, it was broken with the birth of Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? I hadn't thought about that till just now, but... What a dual meaning right there. Let's move forward. Verse 15 says, I will lay waste the mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools, and I will bring the blind by a way they do not know, in paths they have not known. And I will turn darkness before them into light, and the rough places, and the rough places smooth. These are the things that I will do, and I will not forsake them. They will be turned back Utterly put to shame those trusting in idols who say to molten images, you are our gods. And so when we look in the previous verses, what is God going to come and to crush and to destroy? What, is God, uh, what has God been holding his peace about and now he is no longer going to hold his peace? Well, it's, it's idolatry, just like we've been talking about. So he's crushing and destroying the idols and then he's going to birth this new thing but it's very curious to me when I look at, at these, because we talked before, really, about the mountains being 
um, a mindset and that God has given us this, this power through the Holy Spirit to be able to thresh the mountains like he's empowered us to be able to tear those things out of our lives, those wrong ways of thinking, those wrong things that we're following in our life. He's empowered us to like take care of that through him. And it's really interesting to me, he adds like another layer to this for me. He says, I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. Now, I don't, I don't claim to know exactly what that means, but here's what I think it means, okay? That the idols that we have, there is a little bit of sustenance in them. It doesn't act, it's not actually healthy for you, but it's enough to keep you going. And so my example, you guys know my love for Oreo cookies, okay? It's been a while since I preached about Oreo cookies. The greatest form of capitalism that the world has ever seen. Still blows my mind every time I eat one. Can't understand it. Anyways, if you want to know more about Oreo cookies, see me after the sermon. Oreo cookies will get you by for a little while. They're not good for your waistline. They're not good for your body. There ain't nothing good in them. If you look through like the nutritional facts on the back of the Oreo box, it is a pile of chemicals and garbage. Like they're absolutely horrible for you. And I can eat a whole sleeve of them with no problem whatsoever. They are so delicious, I just don't even understand it. That's kind of like the idols in our lives. They taste good in the moment, but it's not actually providing any pleasure or any, it's not, it's providing momentary pleasure, but it's not providing real sustenance to your body. Like you'd be much better off with a bag of carrots. You'd be much better off with a kale salad. And you can actually learn to enjoy kale salad. Ask me how I know. It takes a while. It takes a while. (laughs) But eventually, You can actually grow to crave the good things rather than the bad. And so all of the idols in our lives, the reason that we're caught in them, the reason that we're trapped in them is because they give us some kind of pleasure. What I think God is showing us here is he's like, I'm going to destroy the pleasure that that idol gives you first, and then I'm going to destroy it in your life. And when I think about that, that actually happened to me a lot of different times. Like when God was pulling me out of alcoholism, there was a time where it was like it was like I became more and more miserable at the end of every party. It was like I'd get excited for the party, and the beginning of the party was good, and then it was like at the end of the party, I was like, "Man, I am. This is not. Why? Why?" And then the next time, it was like three quarters of the way into the party, and I could already feel that feeling coming, and I was like. I'm already empty. And then the time after that, we were only halfway through the party, and I was like, what are we doing? I'm wasting my life. And then the next time, before the party even started, I was like, I don't even want to do this anymore. It was like he ripped all of the pleasure out of that first, and then he destroyed the idol in my life. Anyone else that ever happened to? Where you start to realize, ooh, this is not good for me. Or you... (laughs) Man, I've heard sermons before, and it's like something that I do, and the preacher says it, and I'm like, why did you say that? Now I can never enjoy that again. (laughs) That's God working. That's God destroying all the vegetation out of that idle mountain in your life. He's destroying all of the sustenance, all of the joy that you get out of it, and he's preparing to rip it out of your life. And we should celebrate when it happens. Our flesh wants to mourn when it happens because we think that we're losing something so good, something so pleasurable, something that made me so happy. No. He has something far greater for you. Far greater for you. And he says it again, right? I'll dry up the pools. Like those, those rivers, those rushing rivers that are idols in our lives, there's, there's really awesome spots to hang out. Like Buttermilk Falls, right? You can go up there when it's clean. You can go up there when it's clean. You can hang out in the water, uh, but if that was like an idol in your life, it's like God saying, I'm going to dry up all those pools of pleasure in this idol, and then I'm going to destroy it entirely. I hope you can relate to that the same way I can. 
because it was like when I read it, it just leaped off the page to me, and I was like, oh, that's so good. Let's keep going. Hear you deaf. There it is. Hear you deaf. Look you blind so that you may see. Who's blind but my servant or deaf is my messenger that I send? Who is so blind as the one in covenant with me? Blind as the Lord's servant. You've seen many things, but you do not pay attention. Though ears are open, nobody hears. And here we have like one of the greatest heartbreaks of all. When I first read this, I was thinking, like, he's been referring to, he's saying, my messenger and my servant, um, what we talked about earlier in the chapter, he was actually talking about Jesus. But now he made, he made this switch in verse, uh, in verse 14 to change to talking about the people of Israel. And so who do we think he's talking here about the servant and the messenger? Sarah? Israel? And specifically, who in Israel? Yeah. There were two groups of people that were kind of leading the, the religious movement in Israel. It was the priests and the prophets. The priests and the prophets. And there were all kinds, if you read through the Old Testament, there's all kinds of times, and God is most harsh almost every time on the priests that are giving false sacrifices and on the prophets that are giving false prophecies. He's very harsh on Israel, but he's way more harsh on those that are leading Israel into that time of sin. And he's saying, so he's saying, who's more blind than the priests who are supposed to be seeking me in everything? Who is more deaf than the messenger that I am speaking to, but they're not speaking my words, they're speaking false words instead? Like, there's nothing worse to God than someone who is supposed to have this special access to him and then utilizes it not for good, but for evil. It's the greatest heartbreak of all. And I think that's a lot of what breaks God's heart about the church. Because you and I have even greater access than any of the priests or the prophets ever had. You and I have greater opportunity to hear from him, to know and understand him, to walk in his ways than they ever had. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 4 puts it this way. It's impossible for those who were once enlightened, having tasted of the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Ruach HaKodesh, which is the Holy Spirit. It's impossible for those having tasted the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit and having tasted the good word of God and the powers of the time to come, and then have fallen away. It's impossible for them to renew again to repentance, since they are crucifying again the Son of God and publicly disgracing him. So I think the writer is Paul in Hebrews. There's a lot of argument about that, but I'm, I always just say, so Paul, I believe here, is speaking to the Hebrew people, and he's saying, look, <laughs> I mean, Paul was a preacher of grace. Paul was a man of grace. Like, he, he, led, he led angry mobs in murdering people. And then came to Jesus, and all was forgiven, and he was transformed, okay? So if there's anyone that understands the grace of God, it would be someone like that, right? And here he says, it's impossible if you are once enlightened, if you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, if you've gotten this heavenly gift, if you've partaken in the Holy Spirit, if you've tasted of the good to come, it's impossible for someone like that after they've fallen away to be renewed again to repentance. Wow. So you can lead angry mobs to murder people and find repentance. But you can't taste of the Holy Spirit and give him up and find repentance. It's one of the scariest verses in the whole Bible. If you've been saved, if you've been walking in Holy Spirit, if you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, that should, um, that should cause you to do a double take about your own life. I know it does about mine every time I read it. And I pray, there but for the grace of God go I. God, thank you for holding on to me. Thank you for keeping me. Thank you every time that I wander off the path, your Holy Spirit speaks to me and brings me back. I don't want to ever end up in that place again. And we see in verse 6 what makes it so terrible. 
Like if you've gotten the grace of God, you basically you've accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. His blood poured out for you on the cross. And for us to take that and give that up and completely walk away, it's like we're killing Jesus all over again. Except not for not God doing it for all of humanity, but you doing it. God, don't let us go that way. I'm not preaching something today that says you're saved today and unsaved tomorrow if you do something wrong. I'm not saying that at all. But if your style of life was once walking with God and now your style of life is completely walking away from him, that there are two opposites there, um, be warned. You're in a bad place. That doesn't mean that our lives don't go up and down. It doesn't mean that we don't have good days and bad days. It doesn't mean that some days we're walking more in the flesh and some days we're walking more in the spirit. That still happens. Happens to the very best of us. Happens to people far greater than me or any of you. He has grace for that. But if you taste and see and then walk away completely, you're in a bad place. You're, in fact, there's no worse place you could be. You with me? Absolutely. I think it's the same thing, yeah. Joanne's referring to a time when Jesus said that there's one, there's one unforgivable sin. Yeah, I believe that that points to the same thing, yes. That the unforgivable sin would be to accept God as Lord and Savior, to accept Holy Spirit into your life, and then to completely reject Him and walk away. I never used to believe that that was possible, actually. I believed more in a once saved, always saved kind of mentality. And honestly, I still, um, I still kind of lean that way most of the time, that we have security in God that says that He... Um, that he holds us in the palm of his hand like he protects us. But it never says that we can't jump out. <laughs> apostasy? Yeah, it would be apostasy. Yeah, absolutely. Good questions. Good. Co I like it. I like when you guys talk more. Isn't it more fun when you talk more? All right, anyways. <laughs> Let's move on. 21, the Lord was pleased for the sake of his righteousness to make Torah, the law, great and glorious. So God, he gave the law. We, a lot of us think, when we think about the law, we think about all the rules and regulations that God gave the people of Israel, and it just seems like, man, he just like took away all the fun stuff, didn't he? I mean, yeah, there was some stuff there we disagreed with, but man, the Jews, they really had to live a, a pretty pious life. We never gave the law in order for anyone's fun to be squelched. He actually gave it so that we could actually live in joy in the way that we were intended to live. So it's for the sake of his righteousness to make the law great and to make the law glorious. 22, but this is a people robbed and looted. Wow, okay, that's strong words. All of them are trapped in holes, hidden away in prisons. They have become a prey with no one to deliver them and plunder with no one to say, give them back. Wow. Wow. I love that verse. I really love that verse. And he, he brings it all together here in just a little while. So, But what a picture. God gave his law not to punish us, but to be a perfect representation on earth of his righteousness, his greatness, and his glory. But the very people that he chose to represent him are the ones who seem to be the furthest from him. Like he gave us, he gave humanity, he gave Israel specifically in this verse, this amazing treasure to be his children and they would be his God. And they were robbed of it through their own sinful actions, through the temptation of the enemy, and isn't that just what the enemy would do? He's only here to steal and to kill and destroy. That's, that's the enemy's primary motivation. Like he's still actively trying in your life to steal things from you, to kill you, and to destroy everything that you've ever loved or had purpose for. Wow. Like I said, we're going to come back to that. Let's keep going. We're, we're getting closer to the end here. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will listen and heed hereafter? Who gave Jacob to the looter and Israel to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord? Have we sinned against him? In his ways that were un they were unwilling to walk, and his Torah, his law, they did not obey. So who do they have to blame? Huh? Themselves. Sorry, the hat might be sticking my ears. You probably, you're, you're all probably yelling it out. They have themselves to blame. And the Lord allows it for it to be stolen from them 
Why is that? Well, because a holy God cannot have communion with unholy people. Can't do it. Can't do it, and he won't do it. First Peter talks about <laughs> this as well. Because we know the enemy um, whispered in Eve's ear, the same as he whispers in ours. We make our own decisions, just like her and Adam did as well. But 1 Peter 5, chapter 8, verse 8 says this, Stay alert, watch out. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion searching for someone to devour. Stand up against him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being laid upon your brothers and sisters throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you into his eternal glory through Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. And that could be a whole sermon in itself, just those four words, that he would restore, that he'd bring you back, that he would support, set you on a new foundation, that he would strengthen, bring Holy Spirit inside of you, that you can walk in new life, and that he would establish. So now you're like certain, you're secure, you're ready to move forward, like, wow. So the enemy wants to steal all that stuff from you, but God, through the power of Holy Spirit, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, wants to restore everything. And so these people, they're not willing to obey, and then we see in verse 25, so he poured out on him the fury of his anger and the fierceness of battle. It blazed all around him, yet he did not understand it. It burned him, yet he did not take it to heart. And so here is Israel... In Israel's sin, the fury of God, the anger of God, the fierceness of God, the fire of God begins to hurt and to harm. Why would God do such a thing to us? Why do bad things happen in this world? Well, it's the consequences of our sin, and it should be a clarion call to go back to the Lord. To turn to him. Now that's the end of the chapter. That feels a very unsatisfying end, doesn't it? That's because it's not the end. It's not the end at all. You have to realize when you read the Bible sometimes, you're going to learn something today. You ready? When you read the Bible sometimes, the words themselves are inspired. The chapter and verse numbers are not. Okay? Okay? When they wrote, when Isaiah wrote the, the book of Isaiah, he didn't say, chapter 42, verse 1, this is what I say. No, it was one long scroll, didn't have numbers, it didn't have any of that. We put that in there, the church put that in there as an organizational structure, so now we can break it down and we can point people more accurately to what is a pretty big book. Like, it can be hard to find things in here. So you can imagine it's a lot easier than saying, yeah, Isaiah, about three-quarters of the way down. Yeah. <laughs> Did you learn that? Did you know that before you came in here? All right, you've taken something home today. Let's go. All right, good. So God pours out his furious anger. The reason that we know this is not inspired is because chapter 43 starts with a word. That word is... But, you can't say but without a thought before that. Like, nobody starts a story and says the word but to start, okay? But, now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. Wow. Wow. All of the fire, all of the fury, all of the fierceness, everything of God coming down on Israel. And God says these words. I created you. I formed you. Don't be afraid, even in the midst of all that. I've redeemed you. Whew. Now we got to think back here earlier. I believe God is just pointing directly back to this. I think it's so good. 
Wait, I'm missing a line there. I'm so sorry. After fear not, I have redeemed you. It says still in verse 1, I have called you by name. You are mine. Do you remember what we read earlier? Let's go back to it. Verse 22, right here. Look at that. This is a people robbed and looted, all of them trapped in holes, hidden away in prisons. They have become prey with no one to deliver them, and they've become plunder with no one to say, give them back. And here we have, God says, a little bit later, I have redeemed you, you are mine. I'm taking them back. These are my people. They don't belong to the enemy. They don't belong in a life of sin. I'm going to redeem them, and I'm taking them back for myself. That just gives me goosebumps all over the place. There is an ever-present solution to every problem that we are ever presented with in this life. When you're stuck, when you're in prison, when you're stuck, you know, people don't have the, a way to get themselves out. You're in prison. It means you're in chains. It means you're locked in. There's no way out. If you're blind, you can't see. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking absurdities here, right? When you're deaf, you can't hear. Someone has to make you see if you're going to see. And someone has to make you hear if you're going to hear. If you're a slave, you can't be free. Someone has to make you free. And if you have nobody to say, give them back, then you'll be in prison forever. You're stuck there. But God, looking forward here in the book of Isaiah, he talks about a time of redemption, and we are living out that redemption today. God has redeemed you. What does redeemed mean? Well, redeemed is to be paid for. Redeemed is to be bought back out of something. And so the people that are enslaved and stuck and blind and deaf and poor, God looks at the sins that enslave them. He looks at the prison, the enemy has put them in, and he says, give them back. And the enemy would look and say, well, what authority do you have on that? These are sinners. They have no right to be in your presence anyway. How could you ever bring them to you? And he points to the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood that was poured out that took our sins that made us like scarlet and washed them white as snow. And he says, give them back. Oh, man. Is he good or is he good? He's so good, friends. I don't ever want to put a butt on that story, but I have to. When we talk about redemption, I heard this illustration a while ago. I feel like it's really shallow, um, but I'm going to share it anyway because it helps to make sense of this. The cross of Jesus Christ is like every single person in here. God has given you a coupon. That's what I think of when I think of the word redeemed. You ever see on the bottom of the coupon, it says, this coupon has a value of one one-hundredth of a penny. You ever see that? It's like, this coupon has no value whatsoever until redeemed. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ, has gone to every one of you and says, Peggy, here's a coupon. This pays for all of your sins, and you now get eternal life. Every single one of us, Cody, here's a coupon. This pays for all of your sins through the blood of Jesus Christ, and you can have eternal life. Every single person in the world has been given that coupon. But that coupon has no value until redeemed. You have to take it to the Lord. You have to accept him as your Lord and Savior. You have to say, God, not my way anymore, but your way. God, I don't want to live as a slave to sin. I don't want to live in prison. I don't want to live blind. I don't want to live death, deaf. I want to be free. And God says, I'm taking you back. 
You've been redeemed, friend. So if you've never made that decision, we can give all the hallelujahs we want. We can proclaim and say that God is good, but until you redeem that coupon in your life, it will not be applied to you. You have to accept him as your Lord and Savior. For all who believe in him can have eternal life. It's not just a blanket statement for everyone in the world, no matter what, unconditionally. He does give grace unconditionally. But we have to still accept that grace in our lives. You with me? Does it make sense? Do you understand? Praise the Lord. He's so good. Father God, this is our story. We are in prison and there's no earthly means for us to be bought back. There's no way on earth that we can claw our way out. There's no way that these blind people can see. There's no way that these deaf people can hear on their own. God, we know and we understand that it all has to come from you. We thank you for making a way. We thank you that you cared enough for us to buy us back with the life of your son to pay for our sins to bring us into new life. We thank you that now we can be people who see, that we can be people who hear, that we can be people who understand, that we can be people who walk in your ways, that we can be people who can walk in new life because of the redemption through Jesus. Help us to celebrate him, Lord, in everything we do. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. Man, he's good. Man, is he good. Um, you guys just want to worship him one more time? <laughs> yeah. I know it's kind of late. I feel like if we've been going later and later. Let's just switch to two hour services. You know, good with that? No, I'm just joking. Maybe we will, though. <laughs> Maybe I'm not joking. Um, why don't you stand with us? Let's just sing to him. Oh, man, you're good, God. Can we just say he's good? Can we just say... Your love is devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old and Your love is enduring Through the winter rain and Beyond the horizon With mercy for today Faithful you have been, and faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me, and that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips. 
ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Father, the orphan, your kindness makes us whole. And you showed our weakness, and your strength becomes our own. You're making me like new, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes. For you will have your bride, free of all the guilt. why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. be praised, you will be praised, with angels and saints we sing worthy are you Lord, you will be praised, you will be praised, with angels and saints we sing worthy are you Lord, you will be praised. and saints we sing worthy are you Lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you Lord and it's why I sing your praise will never be on my lips never be on my One more time, you will be praised. You will be praised. You will be praised. With angels and saints, we sing worthy are you, Lord. You will be praised. You will be praised. With angels and saints we sing, worthy are you, Lord. Lord, we thank you. That you've given us eyes to see, that you've given us ears to hear. And that you've given us a mouth that can praise you, Lord. God, let us use this great privilege to spread your fame on this earth. Lord, if there's anyone in here that has been walking in darkness, Lord, let them see tonight, today, this day, that they hold a coupon for eternal life, that they need only come to you, and their redemption is sure. That the blood of Jesus that can cover them just the same as it has covered so many of us, that there can be transformation through your power, and through your glory. Let us leave here in the joy that can only come from you. In Jesus' name, amen.
encourage you to stick around as long as you want, talk with each other, love on each other, share with each other. We are family after all.